So many good stories. We have a God who authors great stories. And um, so glad you got to see a little bit of what's going to be happening in the next service. You can come back to the second service if you'd like. You know, we'd love to have you back to celebrate with them. You can get extra credit. Maybe you don't have to come next Sunday, something like that. But hey, this is a day of celebration. It's certainly a day of joy and celebration for those 14 individuals and their families. We rejoice with all of you. But it's also a day of celebration for all of us here. And let me just say a word to you. If this is a church where you serve, if you give of your time, if this is a church where you give a measure of your financial resources, if this is a church that you pray for, if this is a place where you greet people with a warm hug and a smile, look at what God has allowed us to be a part of together. We have a God who's calling people into his family to make them as sons and daughters, and we get to play a little part in all of this. And I hope that there's a, a warmth in your own heart, not just saying, wow, what a great story, but isn't it cool that we get to play a little part in collectively what God is doing in and through this church? Let's give God just a big round of applause for that. We have a God who's authoring great stories, and he'd love to author more, and I'm guessing that some of you maybe hear, hear these stories and wonder, could that ever be my experience? We have a God who's pursuing people and wants to make you part of his family too. And that maybe today you're gonna to come to a little bit of deeper understanding about what that means and what that looks like. As you talk about stories, I love new stories, good stories, because I'm not really a person who likes to watch a movie that I've seen before. Once I've seen it, I kind of know the story. There's a handful of movies I like to watch over and over again. One of them is Hoosiers. How many of you have seen the movie Hoosiers? If you've never seen it, it's the story about Hickory High School, this little rural high school in Indiana that wins the Indiana State Basketball Championship. Every year that they kind of have this kind of contest of the best sports movie, movies ever made, uh, Hoosiers always makes the top five list. Just before the last play of the championship game, Coach Norman Dale gathers his team together to prepare for the final shot. He tells them, he tells them that the team that they're playing is going to expect that their best player is going to take the final shot, so we're going to use him as a decoy. We're going to set a screen for another player, and he's going to take the final shot. And then he says, kind of puts his hand in the middle and says, kind of basically, one, two, three, let's go out there and take the floor. And just as he's doing so, he can tell that something isn't right. They're not ready to go out and take the floor. I mean, this is their chance to go out and win the state championship, and they all have this look on their face like, yeah, we're not ready to do this. And so he asks them, What's the matter with you? And there's a silence in the little huddle before him. And then the best player on the team, Jimmy Chitwood, says, I'll make it. And all of a sudden, as he looks around the huddle, he realizes the entire team wants their best player, Jimmy, to take the shot. So to his credit, he hears what they want to do, changes his plan, and sets it up for Jimmy to take the final shot, and they shock the world, and the rest is Indiana high school basketball history, right? But what Coach Dale does in that moment is essentially what Nehemiah does in Nehemiah chapter 5. If you haven't been with us, uh, we're in a series on Nehemiah called Nehemiah, A Life of Purpose, and that's because this fall, we've been asking these big questions that most all of us are asking about identity and purpose and direction. And we've kind of been reminding each other every week that, you know, God has a special call and purpose for every single one of us. And no matter who you are, no matter how kind of late in the game it might feel for you, God still has plans and purposes for the days and months and years that you have. And we were, we're in the book of Nehemiah because he's an example of a man living with purpose. Throughout the book, we see him have many different callings at different seasons of his life. And right now, the main focus for Nehemiah is on rebuilding the city wall of Jerusalem. The wall had been torn down decades earlier when Babylon ransacked Jerusalem, leveled the entire city. The wall was in rubble, and Jerusalem is now a unprotected city and because of that the city remained desolate because it couldn't be developed because there was no protection and they also knew that because the reputation of God was linked to the condition of Jerusalem and the health and vitality of God's people that God and his people are now viewed as a disgrace because of the condition of Jerusalem so Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem he rallies the ragtag residents of Jerusalem in and around the city 
and they're called by God to rebuild the wall of the city. And they say, because of this, Jerusalem, and more importantly, God will no longer be a disgrace. We will help to restore his reputation before the world. And so we've been kind of in this journey. We've seen that they built the wall to half its height. And last week, we saw they had to work through criticism and work through a fatigue and loss of confidence and other things. And now they're ready to go to build the second half of the height of the wall. So Nehemiah essentially pulls them all together and say, all right, let's put our hands in the middle. On three, let's everybody say, build that wall. One, two, three. And he goes, build. And he realizes nobody's with him. And he doesn't say this, but essentially like Coach Dale said, he says, what's the matter? What's the matter with you guys? That's where we pick it up in Nehemiah chapter five. Here's what it says. About this time, some of the men and their wives raised a cry of protest against their fellow Jews. They were saying, we have such large families, we need more food to survive. Others said, we've mortgaged our fields and our vineyards and our homes to get food during the famine. And others said, we've had to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay our taxes. We belong to the same family as those who are wealthy, and our children are just like ours, yet they must, we must sell our children into slavery just to get enough money to live. We've already sold some of our daughters, and we're helpless to do anything about it, for our fields and vineyards are already mortgaged to others. So here's Nehemiah trying to get the volunteer workforce going on the Rebuild the Wall project, and he discovers they're having massive financial problems and because of that, their attention isn't on the project at all. These financial problems are really driven by three really pressing issues. Let's identify them. The first one is a regional famine. So here's this group of Jews returning from Persia back to Israel. And uh, Jerusalem, the, the open land there, has not been tilled or cultivated for a long time. And they're not ready to meet the growing demands of the city. The wall builders also put off preparing their own fields and planting them so they could come and serve as volunteers on the wall building team. And when you add to that that the greater region in and around Jerusalem was experiencing a famine because of a drought, there's now a desperate situation for food in and around Jerusalem. We also see in this passage that they're experiencing burdensome taxes. Though Persia has permitted the Jews to return back to Israel to their homeland, Israel still belongs to Persia, and the king wants his taxes, right? And so the king is demanding taxes from their fields and from their vineyards, and he doesn't care about the yield. Whether they have a bumper crop or a sparse return, he wants his money. And tax collection, you probably know, was a corrupt business back then. The tax collectors not only collected the taxes that the king wanted, but they added a little bit so they could line their own pockets and exploit the people by demanding more. A third pressing issue is that there were unjust lending practices. You saw it kind of hinted that in the passage here. As it turned out, even though they were in a famine, there was some extra grain available that a few people had control of. A handful of workers were able to pay money for it, but the rest, the majority of them, had to take out loans at exploitative interest rates. And as collateral, they had to put up their farms, their homes, or their children. And if they didn't pay it back, they would lose their homes, their fields, or their children would be taken as slaves to pay off their debts. And we think we have money problems, right? I mean, can you just imagine having a family meeting with your teenage kids here in a week or two and describing them, hey, we've had a financial setback, you know, somebody's lost their job, something's happened. And the kids go, oh no, does that mean less Christmas presents this year? No, it's actually a little worse than that. We've sold you into slavery. <laughs> Talk about teenage angst, right? There can be a real rebellion there. Now, understandably, these deep and heavy financial problems are weighing so heavily on the workers, they've lost interest in rebuilding. I mean, essentially, the uh, local wall builders union has gone on strike here because of these financial woes. So Nehemiah wants to get the wall project going, but he knows if we don't address these financial problems, this, nothing's going to happen. So Nehemiah starts a little information gathering and he discovers that the nobles and the city officials are the ones who are actually profiting from this crisis. They're taking advantage of the people's misfortune, loaning them money at exorbitant rates, price gouging by selling the grain at inflated prices, and now 
because it would put up as collateral, they are holding the titles of the homes and the farms and the vineyards or in and around Jerusalem. They become kind of like the Mr. Potters of the day. They are accumulating all of the property at pennies on the dollar. And when Nehemiah finds out, he blows a gasket. And he's really torqued off when he finds out, this is fellow Jews doing this to one another. So here's Nehemiah. I mean, this guy is giving everything he has to rally the people together to rebuild the wall so God's people can thrive again and that Israel will no longer be a disgrace. And now, fellow Jews are exploiting their own countrymen, their own brothers and sisters in the family of God, and Nehemiah is steamed, to say the least. Nehemiah is feeling a kind of righteous indignation and he recognized there's a wrong that needs to be righted here. There's an injustice that needs to be corrected. So I want us to see just for the few minutes we have of like, let's see what Nehemiah does here to kind of address and stand up for what is right here. Look at Nehemiah verse six, Nehemiah 5, 6. He says, when I heard their complaints, I was very angry. That's uh, to say the least, right? And then it says, after thinking it over, before Nehemiah does anything rash in the heat of the moment, he takes a measured pause. I like what the ESV translation says. It says specifically, instead of after thinking it over, it says, I took counsel with myself. <laughs> I like that, right? I think Nehemiah is showing us that in order to stand up and do what's right, we often first have to pause and pray. He knows that he's really emotional right now. He is justifiably angry, and he's ready to say something stupid or do something foolish. But Nehemiah is self-aware enough to know, I need to pause. I need to stop. I need to go to God. This is kind of equivalent to typing that tersely written email, but letting it sit in your draft box overnight and praying before you send send, right? Before you hit send. It's taking counsel with yourself in a way that means maybe taking a walk around the block and praying about what you're going to do in response to that infuriating thing that your son or daughter just did. It could mean gathering info from a few different news sources before going off on social media with an overly simplistic, half-informed perspective about an important issue. Nehemiah models a posture of self-control, and he knows he needs the Lord's help and the Lord's guidance. So before just launching out in ways that might bring him a measure of temporary satisfaction, but not really accomplish anything lasting or constructive, Nehemiah takes counsels with him, counsel with himself. And then it says he gathers the people together for a meeting. And at this meeting, he defines the problem, and before him are the victims of this injustice, as well as those benefiting from this unfair treatment. So Nehemiah says something really surprising at this public meeting, verse 10. I myself, as well as my brothers and my workers, have been lending the people money and grain, but now let us stop this business of charging interest. You know what else I notice about the important, uh, important thing to do when taking a stand? And that is to own your own part. You know, as Nehemiah pauses... I'm, get, I'm guessing he probably took a little time to look within, perhaps ask the Holy Spirit to search him. Say, is there anything in my heart that isn't right here? Anything about my spirit, Lord, that isn't right? And as he prayed, I think the Lord reminded Nehemiah, hey, remember, you too are lending money at interest. Now, I'm guessing he was not likely lending money at the usurious rates of interest that the others were, but he's still lending money and making a measure of profit. So he stands before the people with this righteous anger and he owns his part. Issues of social justice are, of course, getting more and more attention over the last few years. It's easy to shout about those who are exploiting others, those who are neglecting the plight of the poor and the oppressed. But before any of that happens, we often should ask, Lord, do I have any part in this? In the wake of the George Floyd murder, lots of people marched and screamed about racism in our police and institutions, and it's justifiable to point out where racism and injustice exist and call for it to be remedied immediately. But it's also important for us to look within and say, do I have any part in this? I think a lot of us would say, there's nothing racist in, in my heart, 
But we have to ask ourselves, have I been an intentional reconciler, reaching out to people of a different race or different ability level, especially those who are vulnerable or overlooked? And as part of owning the problem, maybe it means acknowledging a silent complicity. Maybe I never did anything to add to the problem, but maybe I never really spoke up and did anything to change the problem. Acknowledging, too, that maybe we've benefited or been advantaged by an unjust system is another way that we can own our part. That's essentially what Nehemiah did. Here's the system of which now I, I realize I'm, I'm profiting a measure off the suffering of others. And so he's standing on the moral high ground, and yet he takes the time to own his part and to share it publicly. And then he goes on to the next part about standing up for what's right, and he says, let God's heart be the focus. Sometimes with issues of injustice, the default mode is to view it all through a biblical lens, or excuse me, a political lens, let me say. The Bible's teaching on justice does not fit neatly into a conservative or a progressive political ideology. Nehemiah shows us that God's heart is to be our focus. The Old Testament reveals that God's heart when it comes to loaning money is that interest would not be charged, particularly usurious interest. It shows us that loaning money's not wrong, but doing so at a heavy interest with merciless collateral is unjust. And at a basic level, Scripture tells us that the heart of God is always on the side of the poor and the vulnerable. Yet here they're being exploited, and to make matters worse, it's being done by fellow Jews. The victims are other members of God's family. So what happens here? Then we get to Nehemiah verse 5, verse 9. He says, What you are doing here is not right. Should you not walk in the fear of our God in order to avoid being mocked by enemy nations? He's saying not only what we're doing is violating the heart of God, but by treating fellow Jews this way, we're opening the door for God to be mocked. It's almost like outsiders are looking in and seeing this all fold and saying, oh, is this the standard for how God's people treat one another? Take advantage of each other's suffering, profit off of the difficulties others face? Why are they rebuilding the wall again? Ultimately, so that God and his people will no longer be a disgrace. What Nehemiah is saying is that this shameful exploitation is bringing more shame to God and to his people than this rubble of a wall that we have laying around here. So he's calling them to align with God's heart. Let God's heart be the focus. And then I think what we see is a, the fourth idea is to personally sacrifice to bring freedom and flourishing to all. You know, according to Jesus, a lack of concern for the poor or the disadvantaged is not just a minor oversight or a pedestrian lapse. It indicates something deeply wrong with the heart, with the spiritual compass. And so Jesus clearly calls his people to sacrifice in practical and material ways to help the poor. And as Nehemiah calls for this unjust practice to stop and for them to align their behavior with the heart of God, he also puts his money where his mouth is, literally, on this one. You see, we find out in this chapter that Nehemiah has been named the governor of Judah, which means that he now has the right to collect taxes from all of these people, including those who are suffering financially. But here's what it says in verse 17. He says, I regularly fed 150 Jewish officials at my table, besides all the visitors from other lands, yet I refused to claim the governor's food allowance because the people carried a heavy burden. So here he is hosting officials and feeding numerous poor sojourners at his own table, and he does it all at his own expense, even though he could be collecting taxes to do this. You know, taking a stand for what's right will always cost you, but genuine sacrifice will lead to credibility and a special kind of moral authority, and you can feel it here as Nehemiah speaks out. Making things right starts with us. His willingness to stand up in the way he did, remedied an injustice, canceled the debts of those who are deeply burdened, removed the disgrace that was hanging over God and his people, and got the wall building project restarted again. And all of this led to the freedom and flourishing of all. Pretty cool, right? Now I could go on in this passage, but 
let's just stop here for a minute. This is a day of celebration, right? This is our baptism Sunday. And what is it that we celebrate? We celebrate forgiveness and new life in Jesus, or to put it in the language of today's passage, we celebrate 14 people who've had their debts canceled who are now heading towards a life of freedom and flourishing. Now let's just stop and think about that for a minute. Here in the United States, so many are swimming in deep pools of debt. Massive student loans are crushing young adults and young couples. More and more are deeply indebted to sports gambling. You know that Americans now spend 120 billion with a B dollars on internet sports gambling. Crippling credit card interest rates are putting more and more in bondage. I just read this week, First Premier Bank MasterCard now has the highest interest rate of any credit card, 35.99%. Imagine having an oppressive debt load. Let's put a big number out. Let's say you owe a million dollars and you have to live with that every day and think about what it's doing to you and to your family. And in the midst of that, someone comes along and offers to pay it off for you, no strings attached. Can you imagine how freeing and liberating that would feel? Well, describing the work of Jesus on the cross, the Bible often chooses a financial metaphor. We all have a burden of debt, the Bible says, a debt of sin. And the burden is so big, we could never pay it off. To kind of take the metaphor further, a hundred lifetimes of income production could never pay off the size of the debt that we have. It's crushing and enslaving. It destroys hope and joy. It robs us of living the free and liberating life that God intends for all of us. But scripture says that God sent his son, that he would live, that he would teach and be our example, and that then he would die to cancel our debt of sin. He came, he said, to liberate the prisoners and to set the captives free. As Jesus hung on the cross, just before he breathed his last, he said, it is finished, right? It is finished. It was, a, it was a cry of victory that his mission was complete, that he had finished the work that he had come to do. Now, interesting, that three-word phrase, it is finished in English, is only one word in the original Greek, and it's the word that some of you know, tetelestai. In the days of Jesus, when the full purchase price for an item was paid, when there were no more debts outstanding on an account, the bill of sale was stamped with that word, tetelestai, literally meaning paid in full, right? So when Jesus shouts this from the cross, when he says it is finished, or tetelestai, he's announcing that his innocent blood has paid for every last sin of all mankind. If Nehemiah did a noble thing by personally sacrificing to help free some people who are oppressed by debt, Jesus did the most noble and most sacrificial thing when he gave his own life to cancel our debt and everyone's debt of sin. Writing about the Christian call to justice, a man named Dr. Bruce Walke said this, you see that on the screen behind me. The wicked advantage themselves by disadvantaging others. This is his definition of justice but the righteous disadvantage themselves for the advantage of others. Isn't that good? By this definition, Jesus is the most righteous person who ever lived. He left behind the perks and privileges of heaven. He took on human flesh. He died the most cruel, barbaric death any human has ever dreamed up. And he did it all for our advantage, that we might be set free from our debt of sin. And while the payment has already been paid, each person has to uh, personally receive that and apply it to their account, right? Personally appropriate that. Jesus has offered to pay your debt of sin, to set you free of guilt and shame, to set you free and to liberate you for a life of freedom and joy and peace and be on a trajectory towards all that he intends for you. This is his hope. This is his plan for you. So the question is, have you said yes? Have you said yes yes to only being free from this debt of shame and guilt, but then set free to begin to experience the life that he really has in mind for you? 
it basically all starts with a prayer. And I'm going to put that prayer on the screen. And I want you to kind of read it along with me. But if this is an expression of your heart today, I invite you to just pray this in the quietness of your heart. Let me read this. Lord Jesus, I know in my heart that I am a sinful person. I've gone against what I know to be right again and again. I've piled up a debt of sin that I cannot make right. When I think about it, this debt weighs me down with guilt and imprisons me with shame. But I believe you came to liberate me. Your death and the shedding of your innocent blood is enough to pay for my entire debt of sin. There is nothing I can do but to simply accept your offer to pay my debt for me. I believe you want me to live a life of joy and flourishing, and I know that to experience it, I need to start following you and obeying you. I want that, and I trust that you will lead me to a new life. Send your Holy Spirit into my life to help me learn to follow you for the rest of my life. Thank you for loving me and for giving up your life so that I might have life, real life, in you. Amen. This is uh, God's heart, especially on a day like today, that he'd be able to invite even more to become part of his family. And if that was a, a prayer for you today, if you feel the drawing of the Holy Spirit and kind of the, the invitation to let go of this weight that has hung on you for so long. Man, what a perfect day to say yes to the invitation of Jesus. I'm gonna invite our prayer team to come down forward. They're gonna be standing down here. And if, and if that's a prayer you prayed or that you'd like to have somebody help you with that or maybe you wanna process some questions, we would love the privilege to be able to do that. Let's stand and uh, let me close us in prayer now. Father, we've experienced a momentous day of celebration, and we just thank you, Lord. We're reminded that you are a God of love and grace, that you author incredible stories, and that as big as your family is, it's never big enough for you. There's always another one that you want to join you. And Lord, I imagine there's some men and women here who would say, I've, I've never really crossed that line. I've never really said yes to the invitation of Jesus and become part of the family, being able to let go of this debt that weighs on me, that imprisons me. Oh Lord, I pray for those individuals that today would be a day that if they walked in here with a heavy pack on their back, I pray that they would let it go and leave it here and walk out in the joy and freedom that you offer. Lord, today we thank you for sending your son Jesus. We're so close to Christmas where we're reminded that Jesus came. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming. Thank you for all you gave up in coming. Thank you for your sacrifice. You indeed disadvantaged yourself at the most exponential level that we might be advantaged with forgiveness and new life. I pray for all of us, whether we are new in the faith or whether we've been walking with you for a long time, that we would walk out of here with a greater desire to walk with you, to obey you, to serve you, to follow you, and as we sang earlier, to become like Jesus. Thank you for this wonderful day. We uh, give thanks for the 14 that were baptized. We pray, Lord, that you would seal this wonderful decision and that those seeds planted in their heart would grow and bear fruit 50 to 100 fold for the glory of Jesus. Thank you for this great day. As we leave now, may you fill us with your peace and joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.